we were reading this week's Parsha, Parsha Tzavit, it opens with the quality of the olive oil which has to be used for the menorah, for the kindling of menorah. It has to be Shem Zai Zoch Kosis Lamor. It has to be pure olive oil, specifically pressed for illumination. So Rashi explains that the only oil extracted from the olive was the first droplet of oil that was extracted. Because that's the purest of pure. That's Kosis Lamor. It's pressed specifically for more, for illumination. But the Torah expresses itself, Yiko Eilecho. There's a personalization between the Shem and Zayis, the oil, and Moshe Rabbeinu. What's the relevance of the oil to Moshe Rabbeinu? We find that uh, the Gemara tells us about Azora, speaks about God's schedule. What's the schedule throughout the day? So the Gemara tells us that the first three hours a day, what does God do? Yoshe <coughs> Velomi Torah. He sits and studies Torah. <coughs> the second three hours a day, what does he do? He judges the world. <coughs> the third three hours of the day, he sustains the world from the smallest creature to the largest. The fourth three hours a day, he learns with Tinok Shavis Rabon. He learns with the souls of the children who passed away before the age of Bar Mitzvah. <coughs> Mark tells us that if a person is going to save the Amida, or Shoshana, the Musaf, which we have. Zechronos that want to be remembered by God in a good vein, the Rosh Hashanah, being the day of judgment, one should not pray only within the context of a quorum with a minyan. Because the level of intensity of din is as such that one has to have the tzchus tzibor. You have to have the merit of the tzibor. Therefore, one should not pray during the first three hours of the day only within the context of a minyan, of a quorum. So the more asks, but the first three hours a day, God studies Torah. It's only the second three hours a day, God judges the world. So you, I understand, during the moment of just judgment, that's when you have to have the schus of the tzibor, the merit of the tzibor. But when he studies Torah, why do you have to have the merit of the tzibor? So more answers, cites a verse from Mishlei, that Shlomel says, Emis Kenev Al Timkor. Acquire truth and do not sell it. Meaning, truth is unadulterated truth. It cannot be compromised to any degree. There's no compromise. So the whole concept of Rachmin Bedin, mercy within the context of justice, doesn't exist. So if a person prays during the time that Hashem studies Torah, there's no room for, for any degree of compassion it's the harshest moment of judgment because it's a time that God studies Torah which is Emes Emes and the morale explains we speak about truth you study Torah gray is only a question of not understanding there's no gray area if you understand everything it's either permitted or not permitted you deal with it in this context or not in a different context so therefore, judgment, we speak about, there's mediation. There's a degree, there's some give and take. In Torah, there's no give and take. It's either permitted or not permitted. It's either right or wrong. Therefore, when Hashem is sitting and studying Torah, which is Emes, there is no compromise. Therefore, unless you have the Shchus HaTzibor, which is an overriding factor, one should not pray as an individual only within the context of a minyan. That's the Gemara. So Torah is emis. Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, if a person has any degree of ego, a trace of self, there's always a question, how pure is that truth? How pure is it? Because there's always 
a chance, a possibility, there's a conflict of interest. Because there's the self. But Moshe Rabbeinu's level of humility was total negation. It's not no more. There isn't a trace of self. All he is is the pure conduit to communicate the word of Hashem. So whatever enters, it exits as pure as it was when it entered. And this is why Chazal tells us that Shekhinah medabers mitoch grono. He's the only human being that the Divine Presence spoke from his throat. He was literally, when we speak, mitoch grono. But how could it be? He's immortal. And a mortal is what has an identity unto himself. Moshe has no identity. Moshe was totally negated. What am I? I am nothing. So therefore, as a result of that, Torah, which cannot be compromised, is pristine and unadulterated. It is when it comes out of Hashem's mouth. That's how it has to be communicated. The only one qualified for that is who? Is Moshe. The oil represents Torah Shabbal Peh, as we discussed. The menorah is the elucidation and the illumination of the written law. Now, to, if Torah is emes, not to be compromised as much as Nayora, what quality oil must it be? Shem et zayzuch kosis lamor, the first droplet. It's the most, it's the purest of pure. It cannot be pure, if that's the case. That is the symbolism. That is the representation of Torah. Torah illuminates, oil illuminates. It's the elucidation, it's God's commentary of what? Of Torah Shabbat Sav, the written law. Yikho Eilecho. Who is the Makabal Torah? Who received the Torah? Moshe Rabbeinu. Yikho Eilecho. So the oil, the olive oil, of the purest form, has relevance to Moshe Rabbeinu. Therefore, it's Yikho Eilecho. You should be the one. It should be taken to you. So the Ramban writes over here, who is the one who's qualified to make the evaluation if it's sufficiently pure? Yikho Eilecho. Moshe, you're the one. You mean Aaron couldn't? We're talking about it's an eval- it's a physical evaluation. Doesn't make a difference. But what is the evaluation? We're talking about the purity level. When it comes to purity of oil, which is symbolic and synonymous with Torah, the only one is qualified is Moshe, because that's his domain. That's Moshe's domain. Moshe's domain is emes, emes in the mo- in the perfect sense of truth. Therefore, when we make this evaluation to activate the forces, the siyate dishmayo, to be able to process that emes, who's the one who makes that evaluation? This is Moshe's domain. He's the one who makes the evaluation. Therefore, it's viko elecho shem in zayzoch kosis lamor. Okay? This is the reason why it's only Moshe. It's interesting. The Gemara, when it speaks about cheskyo melch Yehuda, Chizkyo, the king of Judah, that within two years, he had given the Jews initially an ultimatum, either live by the Torah or be pierced by the sword. And after two and a half years of his reign, every woman and child from Don to Beersheba were proficient in all the laws of spiritual purity. So there was a question, Sancheriv, who was coming with his armies to destroy Yerushalayim, to destroy the Beis Amikdosh, and this is after the ten tribes were exiled. So God said, what should I do? Should I allow Chizkiyo to go to battle and interrupt his Torah study? Or should I just let him continue studying? He should need to be aware of what's happening, and I will destroy the camp of San Chayru. So the Gemara says that because Chizkiyo allowed the lamp, the oil lamp, to burn late into the night, Therefore, I will not interrupt his Torah study and I will destroy the camp of Sancheret, of Ashur. So he g- gave the charge to Gabriel, the archangel, sharpen your sickle, and in one swoop, the camp of Sancheret was destroyed. But again, because the oil candle was burning late, I will not interrupt his Torah study. It's interesting. What is always the illuminator? What's always the fuel that always identifies the purest and the clearest, and always what you study by. It's by oil, by the oil candle. Because again, the oil represents that purity.
we had once discussed by the Mishkan there were a number of materials that were needed Zov, Kesem, Nechoshes the precious metals of gold and silver then it speaks about Avnei Shom Avdi Muduim the Shom stones that were needed for the ephod, and the other stones that filled in the breastplate which were precious stones, colored stones and when you have the listing of all the materials seemingly they're listed in value it starts Zov Kesem Nechoshes and then it speaks about hides and all the way at the very end it speaks about the precious stones, the diamonds. But if we're going in order of value, of preciousness, it should have started. Avdi Shom, Avdi Muluim, Zov Kesem Nechoshes. Why does it leave it to the very end? So the Arachim HaKodesh explains that who brought the colored stones and the diamonds in the seams. And what happened? They brought it at the very end. Because what did they say? They had said, let the Jews bring what they have to bring, and whatever is lacking, we'll fill in, we'll cover what happened, the Jews immediately nearly brought everything they were nearly left out so Chazal tells the nation is atzlo because they were laid back or in a more earthy term they were lazy therefore they delayed bringing their their contribution and, they, and they were, because of that laziness or that tardiness they nearly were denied the opportunity to participate in the Mishkan Okay? So therefore, even though value material-wise, it, it's the most precious, but because of how it came about, it's deficient in its spiritual quality, therefore it's left to last. It has the least value. Moshe Rabbeinu did not participate in the Mishkan. In the building of the Mishkan, he contributed nothing. And it was, Chazal tells, it was Nashio Aguma, he was a little, slightly down over it. Hashem says, why are you so down? He says, I did not participate in the building of the Mishkan. So God says, why? He says, because I wanted everybody else to participate and what they would be lacking, I would fill in the gap. I'd fill in the void. Hashem says, it's phenomenal. Yours is greater than them, than theirs. No reprimand, no retribution. You will erect the Mishkan, although you didn't build the Mishkan. I mean, here he's singing, Hashem is praising Moshe and singing his praises. And the Nassim, the princes, verbatim the same words, and he's reprimanding them. How do we understand it? Why do we make the differentiation? Now, we say it's atzlus. Because you were lazy, you were tardy, that's why you nearly were left out. But they said, we want everybody else to have a share. Impossible. When an opportunity rises to this level to build a sanctuary where God's presence could dwell. If you really have full understanding what that is, you cannot hold yourself back. You should have been there the first one. Why are we in that? Why does a person feel he has a right to be lazy? It's in, we're not lazy with things that we want. It's only things that we feel it's okay if we delay. Why is it okay? Because there's no reason to rush. It's it has to do with the ego. Because there's me and there's the objective. And if it happens a moment later, is it so terrible? But that's ego. So we're attributing, since the nature of the opportunity is so phenomenal, it is impossible for them to have delayed only because of their laziness. Why? Because they have an ego. Moshe Rabbeinu had no ego. Moshe Rabbeinu was nachnu mo. There wasn't a trace of self. So when he said those words, where were those words emanating from? From truth. So therefore Hashem sings his, sings his praises. It's truly the Shem Shemayim. It's purely for the sake of God. How do I have a right to deny a Jew the opportunity of building the Mishkan? If I should build, participate, maybe I'll be denying another Jew the opportunity. I'll take his place and he won't be able to. It's the same thing. Because Moshe Ben, of course, he was negated to such a degree there wasn't a trace of himself. Of himself. Therefore, those words, they ring true in the most pure sense. Therefore, Hashem sings His praises. Yours will be greater than theirs. You're going to be making the Mishkan. You're going to erect the Mishkan, although you didn't participate in the building of the Mishkan.
There's an Orachim HaKodesh in this week's Parsha. And he explains on an illusionary level, based on the Zohar, he says, Uvederech Remez, Yizbayer HaKosov al Derech Maimur Hu V'Mesefer Zohar Chodosh. We have, we have four exiles. We have the Babylonian, we have the Medes, we have the Persians, and we have the Edomite exile. And whose chus will we redeem from any, each one of these exiles? From Bovel, Poros Modai, Yovon, and Edom. So the Zohar says, Kol echod mehem Every one of these exiles we were redeemed in the merit of one, one person. Golos Risho, the first exile, which was the Babylonian exile, Nigalu B'schus Avroma Vino Levashalom, who was the merit of Avrom. Beis, this is Modai and Poras, Nigalu B'schus Yitzchok. That was the merit of Yitzchok. Gimel, that's the Greeks, which is interesting, which is Torah. B'schus Yaakov. Hadalut, what about the fourth exile that was still dragging our feet? It's 2,000 years, nearly. B'schus Moshe. That's the reason why this gold is so lengthy. This exile is so lengthy. Unless the Jews are properly engaged in Torah Mitzvos, a Moshe Chovitz Ligo, Am Batlonim in Torah. God doesn't want, Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't want that his merit should be used for a nation which are actually they're detached from Torah, not sufficiently invested. You should command them. Ultimately, if they're coming Mashiach, Moshe Rabbeinu is going to be there. The prerequisite to be able to use his merit, we have to be engaged in Torah. You shall take the oil, which is pressed, which is crushed purely. Yirvos el Torah shenipshel l'shemen, ma shemen meir laolam. Just as the oil illuminates the world, kach Torah, oil Torah. Vem divrei azor shkasav misomuch, v'diktik lo mezoch. Zoch is pure. What's pure? So it's written last with Torah l'shmor, l'shmor. What happens to the sediment in the oil? It's not pure. Ol is God loch dome elohim. What's the person does it with self-interest, with an aggrandizement? It's not pure enough. It has to be zoch. What is kosis? Crushed. You have to compromise your physicality. We speak pasnal tochal, my misuratishte, alortishel chayitzar tichyer. There's no way to be fully. Invest in the Torah unless you compromise your physicality. That's kosis. There's a crushing aspect. There's a compromise on the physical. That's why the gold is so lengthy. So there is a personalization. It's interesting. The only way we can be extricated, ultimately, from the last Golos, even though we said Yovan, what was Yovan proposed to? Yovan are the Greeks. They revered the Jew for his great wisdom, his intelligence. The one thing they couldn't tolerate, that that's, it's limited by God. You have to work within God's parameters. They say no. Wisdom is something which is unlimited, unending. Nothing could restrict wisdom. The Jew says, no, we disagree with you. God sets the limits and we invest our wisdom within that, that level of limitation. This was the whole issue. And that's why we accept their perspective whether of idolatry because idolatry is what you believe to be. The person, he creates his own God. With Hashem, we work, we, we submit to God. So, therefore, Yaakov is the schus 
which count as Yovon. That count as Yovon. What's Edom? The only way we're able to subdue Edom is to destroy him is only through Torah at the most advanced level. It says, Hakoko Yaakov Yedaim Yedayesov. When are the Yedaim not Yedayesov? If the call is called Yaakov. If the voice is the voice of Yaakov. What is the most advanced level of Kol Yaakov? That's Chus Hashem Moshe Rabbeinu. No one is, was ever at the level of Torah. He, was, he studied Torah Mipi Hashem, Mipi Agvura, directly. 40 days and 40 nights. Lechem lo achaltim am Moshe Only that dimension of Torah is able to destroy Edom. Therefore, it's only the Chus of Moshe which allows Edom to be, to be destroyed, to extricate us from that exile. But it's interesting. We say, Zoch, you have to compromise your physicality. To what degree? So there's a Yalkut. The Yalkut tells us, Moshe Rabbeinu, before he passed away, tells us, I was in heaven 40 days and 40 nights. Lechem lo chalti ma'im Moshe Sisi. Why is that important to us for us to know? If he did not eat bread, he did not drink water. And if he did, he didn't. Why is that relevant? So the Bedr says, the Moshe Rabbeinu says, why did I have the capacity to acquire Torah? As I sacrificed my blood and my fat for the sake of Torah, because he didn't eat. I mean, he lived, but he was the physically, he was diminished. He compromised his physicality for the sake of the spirituality, that he should be receptacle for Torah. Identically, if you want to be qualified to be the repository and the receptacle for Torah, you must also compromise your physicality. That's lechem lo chalti ma'im lo shosisi. That's what it is. Shem ezay zoch. What is zoch? Dorachim says. You have kosis. You have to compromise your physicality. So you have to meet that standard. Moshe Rabbeinu tells us. How does one engage in Torah? You have to compromise your physicality. So if that's the case, if you're not sufficiently invested, what happens? He's not allowing his chus, his merit, to be used, to be extricated from his golos. It's an interesting. Sephardo, we find ato tetzaber. You should be involved. Ato tetzaber regarding the olive oil. Ato hakre v'leches aron ochicho. This bonavito. And then Atto again telling the artisans to make Atto Tzabel Kol Chachmei Leif. These are the three times. It says Atto, you should be involved. You should be involved making the olive oil, producing it. You should be involved in suling Aaron and his children to be the Kohanim. And you should be involved in explaining to those who have wisdom of heart regarding how to make the various vessels and what was needed for the Mishkan. Why these three areas? So over here, the Rachaim says something very interesting. He says, Old Nire, Kitam Shomer Hashem, Behape Sukim Elu, Gimel Pomivato, why these five Sukim? That Hashem said, and you should. Because he wanted that Moshe should have a distinction in these three areas. Very important. Firstly, all the materials that were given to the Mishkan, you should speak. The actual making of the, the vestments and the vessels of the Mishkan. Avots be samigdosh echot. Va omar Hashem elof ki hu notel schar ki lu hu nasa akol. You should be the one. So therefore, when you that you're speaking to them, it's as if you're delegating it through them. Keneger avos nid v'sam mishkan oma v'atot tetzaver. Ve'ilecho ahim ivim. They bring it to you. Hu mashigomar ome v'ichoi lafirsh ani lachom tetzaver. I'm commanding you to, to do it. Then your view elecho, and they will do your bidding. It's your directive, it's your charge, but you're delegating to others. 
Then Lechsa Mishkan Vatu to Dabir al Kochachme Leif, Ubeze Enum Elish Luchecho. So all the aspects of the Mishkan, every level, they are acting as if you're, ag- you, you're agents. God wanted every aspect of the Mishkan should be done through the agency of Moshe Rabbeinu, Kilu Osom, as if he did it himself. Even Aaron, even though you're not qualified to be the Kohen, he's equipped your agent to do the service. Directly. is incumbent on him and he's allowed to delegate it through agents. So we're talking about our shlichus. As it seems to be, because Hashem wants Moshe to be accredited for every aspect of Avodah, therefore it's your, it's incumbent upon you and you can delegate it through agents. That's how Orachim HaKadosh is learning here. If you remember, we once had the Orachim HaKodesh in Parsha Shlach, when the Jews asked for spies, scouts, to scout out the land. So it says initially they were Anoshim. The spies were Anoshim. Rashi says they were Tzadikim, based on the Medrash. They were devoutly righteous. Afterwards, they became corrupted. How did they become corrupt? How does a person of such a Tzadik? The Torah, Hashem chose who they were initially. And when they left, they were Tzadikim. They were valley righteous, and they became corrupted. So he explains over there, the Rechaim HaKodesh, we have a principle of Shlich Shlom Kamoso. That one's agent who acts in the stead of the one who, del- who delegates him, who commissions him, is the equivalent of the one who's representing. Klal Yisrael themselves were weak in Bitochum and Amuna, trust and belief. They were complaining continuously. I mean, why did they ask for spies? Because they were suspect that maybe it's not what, they, what Hashem says it's going to be. Once you connect to a person and you have that degree of connection as an agent versus the one who you're representing, the influence of the, that connection could actually affect your degree of belief and the, your degree of what? Of trust. So because they were connected to people who are weak in this area, Therefore, it affected them negatively, and they were actually compromised in their own emun and bitochum. So, when they saw the various events in Canaan, of course, they still had choice, they saw it through colored glasses. As a result of this, they came back with these ominous reports. So, when they left, before they were connected as shluchim, as the agents of Klal Yisrael, they were anoshim, they were tzaddikim. The moment the connection was made, the erosion, the questions, the doubts, the spiritual compromise already began. And that's the reason why they became Rishoyim. They became evil as a result of this. So what I said was then that if this is the negative, so what about if somebody connects to somebody very positive? As great as Klausar were, whatever Betzala was, whatever the artisans were, whatever the intent of the people were when they gave the various materials, they were enthused, generosity of the heart, but whatever they were, they were Moshe Rameen. Hashem wants the Mishkan to be the greatest edifice, to have the greatest capacity of spirituality to contain His presence, that they're able, the energies that throw, flow through that medium should have the greatest capacity. Now how do you bring it beyond the capacity of Klal Yisrael? How do you do it? They represent somebody who's the equivalent of Klal Yisrael, who's the Yedid Hashem, who's Neman Bechol Beso, which is Moshe Rabbeinu. So once they connect to him, although they're functioning in their own capacity, but in what capacity are they functioning? As agents. Agents of Moshe. So if that's called the effect, the Siat Dishmayu, that they receive, because now they're not themselves. They're acting as agents of Moshe, so they draw upon his merit to get that more advanced level of siyata deshmayo, so the end result is a greater result. 
That's the value of the Shlichus. Not to accredit Moshe, because Hashem wants Moshe Rabbeinu to be accredited as if he built the Mishkan, as if he gave all the materials, as if he installed our own, and therefore the service is the equivalent of his own. That may be true also, but simultaneously what's happening, that level of connection is what is an eternal connection. And that affects them and brings them to another level. Once mentioned, named Ramchal, that the whole idea that a human being was created with choice, he's the only being in existence that has a choice to choose as he chooses, as he pleases, this intelligent being who's not dictated and controlled by instinct, is because the only way you're able to achieve perfection in the true sense, it has to come from within the person himself. It cannot come from an outside force. If it's an outside force, it's not attributed to the person. So just as Hashem's perfection is attributed to himself, man's perfection has to be attributed to himself, which is his own, cho- his own choice. Once you've created that, you've created a shlemus which reflects God's perfection, and therefore you're able to cleave to God. Because your shlemus, your perfection, is a semblance of God's perfection. Although it's what? It's not... So Ramchal writes, although it cannot be compared, because one's relative and the other one is in the absolute sense what perfection is, but once we establish that commonality, that we reflect God's perfection, Shlemus, now you could attach, you could be Dovik Tashem. Once you could attach to God, now you become part of an infinite. Now your perfection has now become part of an infinite perfection, which is perfect in the absolute sense. This is the Ramchal. So I'm saying, there was no Jew in the history of existence who could cleave to God the way Moshe could cleave to God. Because there were no barriers. If there's no self, there's no self, Moshe. Nachnu mo. So when he attached to God, there was no Moshe. There was only Hashem. So if we ourselves are connected to him, we are his agents in regard to the Mishkan in regard to donation, the no, 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 donating of the materials, in terms of the avoda, what's the dimension of avoda? It's connected to the infinite. The Mar has a question. The person makes a vow that somebody sh- is not permitted to benefit. He will not benefit from a certain person. Okay? So he's not permitted to benefit from that person. If he does benefit, it's a Torah violation. So now a person makes a vow he's not going to benefit from a certain Kohen. And now he has to bring a sacrifice, a korban. Could that Kohen officiate on his behalf? Well, seemingly, he should not because if the Kohen officiates and brings his sacrifice, he's a beneficiary of the sacrifice. But, but the Gemara says, the Talmud says, it's not so simple. If you say, Kohanim shluchi didan, if you say the Kohen is the person's agent, so he's acting as the agent of the person, therefore, of course, he can't do the service. Because he made a vow, not to what? Not to benefit from the Kohen. But if the Kohen is Shluch de Rachmano, he's God's agent, then he's permitted to officiate. Because he's not directly representing the person, he's representing God. The person is a, by the way, beneficiary of the Kohen's activity, but it's not direct. He's not directly connected. So, Gemara has a question Is the Kohen Shluch Didan, is he our agent? Or is he Shluch de Rachmano? Is he the agent of the merciful one, God himself? Murad leaves it unresolved. Unresolved. A person who lives his life, and whatever he does, as we said, perfection is relative. Perfection, in the absolute sense, is what? Is only God. In the absolute. Absolutely perfect. But let's say a person does something truly for the sake of God. L'shem Shemayim. Why am I doing it? I have no self-interest. I'm only doing it because God wants me to do it. What, what would you call that? Shluch de Rachmano? You're God's agent. So we're saying, based on the principle of the Orachim HaKadosh, that when you connect to the one who you're representing, you merit the divine assistance of the one you're connected to. So when you act in that capacity, what is the value of your action? It's not me. I'm, I'm God's agent. Why am I disseminating Torah? I'm God's agent. 
Why am I putting tefillin? Why am I doing anything? I'm God's agent. As a result of that level of connection, the siyate dishmayu, a person merits, it goes beyond his own schosovos. First of all, you have schosovos. You have merit of, of previous generations. This goes beyond. This is what? This is what? This is, this is, this is you connected to God. I was thinking, while well, I'm speaking, the um, mission tells us in Perkyovos that if a person does something, Shem Shemayim, Shosavosim Sayoso, the merit of his forefathers, forefathers, forefathers will assist him in his objective. It's a simple, so what do forefathers mean? So the morale of Prague explains it, it's the Shosavos, Avram and Tzorin Yaakov. You're able to draw on their merit. If you do it not for the sake of God, you can't draw on that merit. But if you do it for the sake of Hashem, you can draw on that merit. He says, why? What's the reason? He says, Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov, they are Klal Yisrael. They are the Jewish people. So if you're acting as an all-compassing Jew, as a representative of God, that is Klal Yisrael. We represent the Ratzon Hashem, the will of God. If that's the case, you could draw on that merit. Because the Ovis HaKadoshim, they are Klal Yisrael. Their merit is Klal Yisrael. So you only have relevance to their merit if you act as Klal Yisrael. So if you do L'Shem Shemayim, that individualism you don't have. It's not me. It's not the I. It's the will of Hashem. And who are we? We represent Kovit Shemayim. That's what we represent. If that's the case, you could draw on, on their merit. But if you don't do it L'Shem Shemayim, although you do the mitzvah, but if you do it with the emphasis, it's me and I, then you have no relevance to that merit. Because that merit, only, you can only take from the communal fund if you're a communal person. You're not a communal person, you're an individual. An individual can't draw from that fund. Therefore, it's chus avoso misayoso. Chazal tell us that initially when Hashem first engaged with Moshe Rabbeinu was in the burning bush and there was a dialogue a seven week dialogue seven day dialogue between Moshe and Hashem that he should go and be the redeemer the goel and continuously came up with various reasons why he's not qualified not worthy he's not qualified the Jews are not qualified and um Finally, Hashem says that the real reason behind it, the real reason behind it was because he was concerned that he has an older brother, Aaron, and he'd be offended. He's younger. If he would be the, the redeemer, Hashem says, no, definitely not. Then when he finds out the son of Belibo will have joy in his heart, nothing to worry about. But then after God responds to every one of his reasons, why not? He says, but why don't you send it with Aaron? There he, overst he stepped, overstepped his bounds. It was considered disrespect. Hashem says, because of this level of disrespect, you will not be the Kohen, you'll be the Levi, and Aaron or Chicho, he will be the Kohen. So he forfeited the priesthood at that moment. Okay? See, it's a pretty big punishment. You'd say, and there's no question, Moshe Benu did tshuva immediately. Did tshuva, he repented. You'd say, is that sufficient punishment? Maybe yes, maybe not. So Rechaim HaKadosh points out who it had to Ato Hakrivis Aronachicha. You must install them. You must dress them. You know how painful that is. Here, I could have had kuna for myself and my children forever because I was obstinate and I overstepped my bounds and forfeited forever. But I, I already... I already paid. I paid my dues. I already had the punishment. Still not enough. So he explains that when a person sins, there's a certain degree of detachment from the source. When one does tshuva and is fully rehabilitated, the neshama reattaches itself to what degree? To the source, to God. It's only to the degree that the rehabilitation took, took, took place. If it's not fully rehabilitated, there's a slight gap. 
It may be infinitesimal. It may be microscopic. But it's not there yet. Moshe Rabbeinu at this point had to undergo that experience. No. Not only not to be pained or to be pained, to do with joy, to do besimcha, to install his brother and their children with joy. That even, why? Because you understand that this is ultimately the remedy for the problem. To reattach. And he says, the Orachim HaKadosh, the Gemara says, Keshem Shevorchan Al-Tov Kach Mevorchan Ra. With this, as one one blesses unto good, it's with joy. One has to acknowledge God with joy when one is pained. God forbid, she says. Doesn't make any sense, seemingly. When you, something good happens, we understand you rejoice. But if something tragic happens, you should rejoice. How do we even put it in perspective? She says that this, this is the understanding. Because a person would truly understand nothing happens randomly. It happens for a reason. Why is God bringing this problem to this person? So that he should be able to have a full reinstatement. You know what means to be re, fully re, 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 re-franchised, reinstated. It's the ultimate. If you would realize that, the pain becomes secondary. The tragedy becomes totally overshadowed with the value of, of what, what's happened. That's Simcha. And that's what Moshe had, had to experience. Despite he forfeited the kuna for himself and his children until the end of time, he had to experience the joy of, re, of installing Aaron and his children to be the Kohanim and not himself for that reason. It's interesting. The Gemara tells us that when you stub your finger on the terrestrial level, they pronounced in the in the heavenly level, the celestial level. Right? When a person stubs his finger below, they already pronounced from above. Nothing is random. So what does that mean? So why did you stub your finger and you, you, you and you scram and you screamed ouch or you saw stars? That's how painful it was? It was for a reason. I should have been more careful. Why was I so clumsy? Now, now I'm not gonna be able to uh, play tennis for the next six weeks. Is that what that's what it's about? It happened for a reason. But why did Hashem want it to happen? So people say, especially if you're a Sfardi, kapara. Right? Atonement. That, but those are words. You have to experience, uh, the way the uh, Orachim is pointing out, you have to experience the joy. You have to put it in perspective that it, it's really a privilege that a Kodesh Baruch is paying attention to you. He wants to help you. It's like, you know, you have people on the battlefield and the, you have one surgeon, he can, can't operate on So Many people have to die. And the, 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 the setting, there's no anesthesia. So what's the choice? Die or be operated with uh, the pain? But you're going to live. Does the person, does he agonize that he's not dying? Despite the level of pain. He's rejoicing that he has that. He was chosen to be the one to live. But what about the pain? It's exactly this. Why was a person chosen to have this tragedy? Because he needs that tragedy. He needs it for his rehabilitation of spirituality. And if a person understands what the value of that is, there could be nothing less than joy. I'll tell you a story, interesting story. Many years ago, a certain uh, Svartic Jew, and he came to me, and he wanted, needed some help to, to get a job. He showed me his resume, so I said to him, uh, by the way, do you put on film every day? He says, no. I said, do you act appropriately as a Jew? Not exactly, which I knew. I said, no. The reason why you're having all this financial diff- other difficulties in your life because you're not behaving as a Jew. I said, stop behaving as you should behave. Hashem will take care of you. He says, but all my friends, they're behaving no differently. They're Jews and they're doing well. Why is God picking on me? Those are his words. I said, you don't understand. 
that that God's taking you and slapping you around and not giving you an opportunity to succeed is because God loves you. The other people, he threw them to the dogs. He really doesn't care about them. Because he cared about them, he wouldn't allow that to take place. You have a schus, you have a merit. And if you'd realize that and understand that, this is the wake-up call. Start putting on tefillin. Start acting, behaving like a Jew. Observe Shabbos properly. And be more pure. And you'll see, your life will turn around. It's the exact same. This is what we're talking about. Instead of complaining and saying, why is God picking on me? Just to the contrary. He's picking on you. That's the expression of love. And this is what Moshe Rabbeinu says to call you as a man disciplines his son identically that's the way God disciplines us and reigns in on us and our Chaim HaKadosh over there explains you see another person's child misbehaving doing terrible things may bother you but it's not the same as if you're a child when your child behaves that way you're not going to tolerate it you're going to intervene immediately and discipline him and not going to allow it to happen the other child so you say well why because this is my child that's somebody else's child same thing. If God, as God, as a man, disciplines his child, regardless of pain that he has to inflict on him, identically, God reigns in on us for the same reason. It's an expression of love. <coughs> we find that a Kohen, Mari tells us that if a Kohen officiates without the vestments, priestly vestments, it's not valid. The service is not valid. And as it says in the Posuk, in the verse, that the vestments are lekavod ulitiferes, for honor and for glory. So the Gemara asks, Moshe had been officiated for seven days. The first seven days when the Mishkan was erected and dismantled, before Aaron was installed as the Kohen with his children, the Kohen God, the high priest. So the Gemara asks, it was asked to Rabbi Akiva, what vestment did Moshe officiate when he brought the sacrifices. So the Gemara answers, he wore a white tunic. He did not wear vestments. So this famous word from the Shalor, the Shalor is, is, explains that initially, what was the vestment of the human being? Adam before he ate the tree of knowledge. His body was the vestment. The person is the neshama, is the soul. The body is the vestment. What happened after he ate of the Eitz Adas, Tovera? So that vestment became putrefied. Because it's laced and intermingled with evil. Therefore, you need a new vestment. Without the vestment, the coin's not qualified. It's inappropriate. But Moshe Rabbeinu, as I once mentioned, Emir Rabchal, there were only two people in the history of existence where the Neshama was within the bodies, not hovering over their heads. Adam before the sin of eating the tree of knowledge. After the sin, then it, it ascended to above his head. Because the body was, was not pure enough to contain the soul in the Shema and Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu, who radiated holiness, who the Shechino, the Divine Presence, spoke to him, Ponim el Ponim, Adabribo, Behokitz lo Bechalom, in a wake state, not in a sleep state, he himself was pure enough and whole enough that the Shema could dwell within him. So Moshe Rabbeinu, the Neshama, could dwell within his body. So what was the quality, spiritual quality of that vestment? It was pure enough. Therefore, the Mar says, Moshe Rabbeinu, he fished it in, in a white tunic. He only needed just to cover his nakedness. But he didn't need the vestment to compensate to be a vestment. But the ordinary Kohen, the Chobot Tiveris, he needs it for honor and for glory. Because anything less than that, it's a disgrace. Because the body itself has already been putrefied and cannot be rehabilitated for this reason. That's the Shalah Kodesh. The Rechaim Kodesh says, in truth, even the Aaron does not need vestments and his children. So why does he have it? And it's, he says, it lies in the word, says, why does he, why do he have to wear vestments? Covered in the Ferris. For honor and for glory. So he explains it this way. He says, he brings it based on the Zohar, do four vest white vestments and do four gold vestments. This is the white vestments correspond to Yud Kevav Four letter name of God, which is more 
exalted name. The gold vestments correspond to Avni, the subordinate letter name of God, Master. Youth gave up the pronunciations, Master, but the spelling is Hoyovia, God is infinite. So therefore, the white is the more advanced. He says, Kovod is the gold vestments. At Tiferes, which is glory, the glory is the white vestments. That's Yud Kei Vav Kei. As he explains, the Mar tells us that the Kohen Gadol, when he officiates in these eight vestments, it atones for many sins. For murder, for corruption and justice, for adultery, for many things. Aaron, because he was the representative of Klal Yisrael, he had to wear those vestments. That you have to have an interchange of Adni and Yudke Vovke to bring about that Kapora. Why did Moshe Rabbein officiate? He officiated, it should be a Kapora for Aaron and Bonov. That although he participated in the Egel, Hashem should embrace him and take him on as a Kohen. So for seven days he officiated to seek forgiveness for Aaron that on the eighth day he should be qualified to be installed as the Kohen Godel. If that's the case, so our, Moshe was not acting on behalf of Klal Yisrael. On behalf of Klal Yisrael, who also needed investments, the covenant to Ferris. But since it was something very specific, it was Aaron and Bonov, therefore, so w- with what did he officiate? A white tunic. Our own. It's not for himself. He represents Klal Yisrael. You need the covenant, you need the honor, and you need the glory.